Uh, my name is Sean Dacey. I'm the curator of Learning and Public Programs at the Contemporary Art Gallery. I'd like to welcome everyone here to the Burrard Marina uh, Fieldhouse Studio. Um, I'm going to say a bit about what this fieldhouse is, and then I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Um, the Fieldhouse Studio is an off-site residency space and community hub organized by the Contemporary Art Gallery and supported by our gracious hosts, the uh, Vancouver Park Board and the City of Vancouver. Um, we have this studio space for three years, um, so hopefully you guys will be coming a lot out here. Um, running parallel to our residency program, so basically the residency program, the way it has been set up at the, at the CAG, uh, we'll be inviting artists for six month residencies. Um, so currently we have local artist Raymond Boisjoli, who's using, actually, if you turn behind you, the second level is the field house. And for those who want to peek in after the talk, I can give you a little tour. I will say it's a little bit messy because Raymond's working in there, so, um, yes. Uh, anyway, running, uh, running parallel uh, to the residency program is an ongoing series of public events for a range of ages, and this is the beginning of one of these uh, public events, uh, a series that I've called Artists in Public, and Catherine and Zoe are our first speakers in the series. Um, basically, I'm inviting, or the CAG is inviting creative and cultural producers to share their foray, forays uh, in developing projects in the public realm. So, uh, this will continue later this summer. We've invited uh, Broken City Lab co-founder Justin Langlois to speak on August the 17th um, and this series will continue over the next three years so watch out for it and look at our new website contemporaryartgallery.ca for information and follow us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and we have an Instagram <laughs> account now too so follow us there. Um, anyway so today we have these two wonderful artists with us uh, collaborators uh, Vancouver based Zoe Cray and German artist Catherine Grau, um, and they recently completed a public project throughout Vancouver uh, entitled uh, Unlearning Weekenders, um, and it's a project that was uh, supported by the Gouda Satellite at, at Vancouver uh, in, in cooperation with Dance True Practice, Windsor House School, and pub Public Dreams and Revised Projects. Uh, Unlearning Weekenders was a series of workshops that invited the public to co-develop a public procession, looking for new ways to activate uh, their perceptions and find creative forms of criticality. With the use of props, costumes, and individual and collective bodies, the project sought to challenge invisible social structures, disrupt hierarchies, celebrate new narrative, and reclaim internal personal space and, and external public space. And I was a part of a small portion of it and helped them light a fire last weekend, but it was a long 12-hour day for a lot of people and I'm excited to hear them talk about it, so I'll pass it on to you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, okay. So, as Sean already said, this Unlearning Weekenders project um, was funded through the Goethe satellite and it was actually for us a one-year project that took us on a trip to India and through a series of uh, workshops here on the West Coast as we were exploring like ways of unlearning. And we actually want to start today with a small gesture and action. Um, as you can see, we've lowered the Canadian flag on this flagpole and we are about to raise a flag that we made. And maybe somebody wants to volunteer to help yeah. raise yeah, we'd it like to as a little way of kicking off this. Yeah, if everybody could come and join us around the flag for the raising, and, and we can each take a turn uh, it up if you like. As it has like the kind of two slogans that have been leading us to this project. One being, you are here to feel. Yeah. And the other <laughs> being, there is more to life than we know. Ah, the wind's even going to come for us. So, so I'll start. Maybe we can take turns giving it a tug. It, uh, it's pretty tight, so <laughs> it's, it's exhausting to do the whole thing. It's not so bad. And 
want to give it a go? I'll give it a go. <laughs> that one. background to how we have come to this term of unlearning and also like the kind of definitions around that term that we've been referring to and have been using as a kind of leading thread throughout the project and the two of us have collaborated on a number of projects before and both are part of an artist collective in Berlin called Process Institute and we did a lot of work around pedagogy and kind of hosting some kind of platforms of education exchange and trade schools and free schools. We have been looking into that for quite a while and then stumbled across the term unlearning and just found that it captured our imagination on a much deeper level than the kind of like political activism around education. Maybe, can I just interject for a second? I just wanted to say too, just as a background, we met while we were studying together in Germany. We both did a master's in public art and um, new artistic strategies. And so we met there doing singular work and then pretty much since then have been collaborating together in public space and, and working with publics. So just as a background. So with our collective in Berlin, we started doing these unlearning rituals, which would be kind of pop-up events throughout the city where we would just temporarily for a day claim public spaces and invite the public around different themes to take over that space and to explore different methods of engagement with each other. So one of them was around um, kind of collectivism and collaboration. So we, we took over a cafe and hosted a big like a workshop in the cafe where we are just experimenting different ways of collaborating and building these props and then took it out to the street. Or another one was around sharing food. Um, yeah, so we started like digging in more deeply into this term of unlearning and came across an organization in India called Shikshantar that is spearheaded by Manish Jain who's been working around education for the last 10 years. And this is one of the publications they put out. Um, so no. <laughs> and I just want to read from it the definition they give for unlearning because it definitely rings true for us. There are several different dimensions that people associate with the concept of unlearning, namely deconditioning, decolonizing, deprogramming, deschooling, unschooling, deprofessionalizing and deinstitutionalizing. At its most basic level, unlearning starts with looking at the realities and possibilities of life forms from other points of view. It is about becoming more conscious of the different assumptions, abstractions, stereotypes, expectations, etc. that influence how we understand the world, how we create knowledge, how we relate to each other, how we act and how we grow. It is about resisting and creating space to breathe. Unlearning is not about negation. It does not simply mean rejecting big lies, breaking away from imposed categories, overcoming our fears or anxieties. Rather, there are many regenerative aspects in it. Unlearning opens up new opportunities for self-directed learning and co-learning. It is a process that involves listening both inwards and outwards, journeying from the known into the unknown, conducting our own experiments with truth and trying to see the whole as we slowly become whole again. So this is something that's kind of been inspiring to us in terms of like looking inward and looking outward, like critically reflecting on the education and conditioning and kind of trying to un think some of these like dominant Western paradigms, but really on a level of how do we embody these things? How do we live these things? And where do we start to unlearn them in our bodies, in our relationships with each other? So as part of this project, we took a trip to India and 
sought out some of these organizations that we've been like looking into on the internet and just have found like a lot of inspirational reading on. And so we were there over this Christmas. And do your slides. Yeah, maybe you can open those slides and I can just quickly say like these two quotes, you're here to feel and there's more to life than we know, kind of came out of that journey and along that journey we just encountered lots of inspiring people, Buddhist monks and crazy expats and uh, yeah, locals that are just really deeply invested in decolonizing their education system and just the kind of perspective that is embedded in Indian culture is so rich because of the history of teaching they have like from the Buddha through Krishnamurti through Gandhi but then also dealing with the colonial history and kind of dismantling the education system that was imposed by British rule so just the ground like is so fertile and um, yeah I just wanted to give a few examples of the kind of work that Shikshantar does so, um, Shikshantar is the People's Institute for Rethinking Education and Development. They have, um, within that structure, they have a university for walkouts, basically high school students who've dropped out of high school because they cannot cope with the education system and, or failed all their exams and just like need to find their own path in life. They don't really fit into that. A mainstream system there's still a really really strong like the dominant education system is still the British colonial one that hasn't advanced since colonial rule left very much so, mm -hmm. so one of the exercises they do at this um, at this in this program is called the cycle yatra and it's basically when the new semester starts and new students come in they take about a one week to ten day bike trip where they go without money in their pockets, without technology in their pockets, no cell phones, nothing. Just as a group, they go and tour the villages in rural Rajasthan and try to exchange their labor for food and housing. And it's like, yeah, there's lots of ritual also around preparing them to do that and like coming together as a group. But basically it's just going to the most primal place of like sharing, our humanity and on a lot of these villages are they don't even speak the same language so it really like goes directly to the root of how do we negotiate like that someone's hungry or that I can trade my work for food and these photos I mean we were really lucky when we happened to visit them it was over uh, Christmas our Christmas and then the day afterwards they left on the on the cycle yatra so this is the picture of them preparing their bikes and you can see they have handmade signs on the bike that all like send a message of like what they're trying to like journey for on this trip and then this is so the only thing they leave with is like a sleeping mat some um, uh, clothes and they share a plate of food before they head off and they have no food or water or anything on them so from the first moment can we go up one more page? oh sorry before that yeah ah, this one. okay sorry so um and then one other kind of action that I thought was a really nice one that kind of speaks about unlearning in, in, in a personal way as well is a lot of these kids come to the school and do this two-year program of self-directed learning coming yeah, from just a difficult past of not fitting into the mainstream system and also for the parents that's really like a difficult process to go through in most cases of just accepting that their children don't fit into the system and they do this thing where in the middle of the first semester um, the parents can come for a visit and the school is located in this like beautiful ashram in the mountains outside of Udaipur uh, but what they do as the parents arrive is the students guide their own parents into the school blindfolded so this there's like a total reversal of the roles of trust and also the child being able to embody that they have chosen to take their own path now and the parents having to kind of accept that by being blindfolded and being shown into that world by their children so I just thought that's like kind of reflects in a really nice way how some of like also the kind of approach that they have there which is really a, a lot of 
just really about life rather than books or exams. Um, so in the month that we spent in India, we were kind of trying to get as much, take in as much information as possible from these organizations, but we also had like a few moments where... Ah, yeah, it's Nestor's right there. <laughs> We hosted some workshops also with the organizations that were hosting us, so it became a kind of exchange of them showing us how they work and us kind of showing what we're researching by yeah, hosting some workshops. So this image is a workshop we did with SEVA, the Center for Voluntary Education and Action. And they do they host a kind of street theater group that does quite political activist like street performance as a way of bringing education into public space in India and we did a workshop with them which was about unlearning and became very much about like how do we um, connect with ourselves connect with each other connect with the space so really taking it just to a much more of a meta level and like reflecting back on them who are like constantly like putting out information and trying to like give like how can they also like feed back and keep an open mind and not always be the one that have to like have the answers or have to have like the information to put out and uh, since we we posted the workshop in a public square in India in Chandigarh and it very the quickly designed yeah <laughs> he master planned that city that the whole city ago. So. yeah it's a totally bizarre place <laughs> Um, so the, we very quickly had a very big audience and um, you can see this is an image of we were discussing something in a small circle and we decided to stand up and stand in a circle and then we decided to turn around and face out and just look back at the people that were looking at us because um, as soon as like you gathered of like more than six people then suddenly um, everybody started observing and thinking, ah, oh, something's going to happen. So, you know, you're just talking in this cluster and you realize, oh, there's like 20 people like circled Even around us. More, so, like well, 100 people, <laughs> 100 Indians <laughs> circled around us. Like, with the, like, I don't know what they're expecting. It's just a very different, like, also way of being in public space. So we turned around and like looked back at them and then like just intuitively started this action of like asking them to join us in that circle. And then the circle just got bigger, bigger, bigger until it like took up the whole square and just looked out at the space around us. And I think it just, and from then, like as a group, we improvised like how to take this energy, this collective energy through the square and into different situations. But like that moment just became such a powerful image and such a powerful uh, like tool of how to bring people in and how to face back at, at people who are acting as an audience and including them. So that's like something we've brought into the procession and throughout the project. Kind of shows how we deal with public or try to deal with public. Yeah, and I just wanted to do another small reading before I hand it over to Zoe to talk about another aspect of our research. This is a beautiful little reading called Wonderful Uncertainty by the Rex collective, another uh, Indian artist collective, and it kind of speaks to many different things in this project. Um, it says, the best kind of art invokes a reordering of the cognitive and sensory fields. It asks of its actual and potential publics to open doors and windows and let other worlds in. Despite appearances to the contrary, art neither kills nor keeps us alive, but being in the presence of art is sometimes a matter of fathoming exactly how alive we are prepared to be. Okay, so as Catherine said before, this is like this one year of research that has been, there's been ebbs and flows throughout the whole thing. And um, 
Catherine's normally using, living in New York and I'm usually in Vancouver so we had this quite intense trip for three and a half weeks in, in um, India and then we returned to our respective cities and we're like okay how do we continue this work together um, for six months until we're like reunited physically again to actually do the work that we did in Vancouver. So there's um, we started a blog together and just were kind of posting things back and forth and then decided that it would be quite, since we were doing a lot of research on ritual, we decided that it would be really important for us to start having those own ritual practices on our own and then sharing them online together. So it kind of worked, each of us would do something and then post it which would inspire the other one and we'd sort of keep kicking off like that. Um, this is a... Uh, a really beautiful um, little publication that um, Sean Wilson has done um, on indigenous research methods and the publication is called Research is Ceremony. So this is a text from his that we were often reflecting upon through the process. Um, so here's to start an example. Um, this is in the forest here. Um, I was living near Stanley Park and so I was going out like a few days a week and um, we had decided that we would find in India there's often um, ceremonial trees that people are using within their villages so we thought that we would each find like a tree that would be kind of a site for us to work with and then it would become sort of the walk and ritual to get to that place and we would each do kind of performative actions there. So this is one that I had done in Stanley Park. It says there's more to life than we know. It's the same this same refrain. This is the first iteration of it <laughs> in, in the sticks. Um, you can see on the blog, like there, it goes into much more depth of this too. It got answered back to me um, once I left that in the forest as well by somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is what Catherine had done as well. Um, just gonna read, we were recently at Open Engagement Conference and Claire Doherty gave a talk there. I think it was quite interesting. She was speaking about social practice art um, as usually having a repetition, or sorry, a reputation of being only affirmative or reverent or celebratory. But yet there are these deeper, deeper, less visible layers that are transformative, viral, and public. And she was describing this latter kind of work um, as something, a kind of work that is looking for something and producing that which it is searching for. And I thought this like really resonated for us and I think in terms of like producing this work as research rather than like singular art projects really was this you know there are certain things that we're searching for but there is a need to embody and enact these within that search. Um, so here's an example um, of Catherine doing some unlearning at her tree spot. So the little board says um, Please leave your knowledge here, thank you. And then she's inside the, the circle around the tree of this. Um, this is something that I did, um, kind of reenacted a traditional Ayurvedic technique where you use um, mud or clay to um, uh, create this container on a body. And then you usually um, use hot oil to like draw out some toxins um, out of that area of the body. So I did this on, on the tree that I had been working with. There's a close-up of it. I was using a hot tea that I had made. And then from that, then taking some um, of the moss from that tree and then bringing it home and using that as like a healing technique on like pains that I had on my own body. So just like kind of trying to like develop our own ritual practices that really incorporate what was going on for us in our daily lives. Um, here's Catherine again doing some um, balancing acts um, on this bar in looking over Manhattan and also you had said to like challenging yourself to what kind of risks you could take with this because she had been also she would take a one hour walk before getting to her tree each morning and then that walk became a large part of her practice of, um, of this exchange of ritual back and forth and so and then kind of each time pushing yourself like actually what are my boundaries of this and um, so this day was, was about risk, some physical risk. It's another example. Um, also this, um, a year ago when we first started this project, we met in, in Berlin where we were spending the summer together and we were doing some 
some visualization practice and then doing paintings from that visualization. So a lot of this was like body work that we had just started reading about. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit later about the role that dance has played in this project for us. Um, but both of us don't come from a background of movement. And so when we started doing this work around unlearning, we were realizing like if we're trying to de-intellectualize and get more connected with our bodies, like we're actually needing to discover some techniques for doing that. So we'd done a lot of this um, visualization. So and then these are some paintings from it that then we enacted in public space um, like almost a year later. Well, we more we enacted the the visualization again, and then when we had done it the first time, each person was lying, and the other did a guided visualization for them. And then when it finished, we did a painting of what of the imagery that came up. So this time, what we did was that we built around the body with the elements that we found like this one at the beach and then there's another one in the forest so doing that more in a kind of like sculptural way so trying to bring like Im physical imagery to that visualized imagery so here's another one so i just there wasn't a little literal translation between these but more of like different evolutions of how we were doing that most of them yeah Yeah, people take a look. Yeah, it's pretty dense, so um, we just pulled out a few things for today to follow it, but yeah. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of try to like bring some, sum up a bit again before we move into our research around dance, is that, so some of the origins of this research around unlearning are quite like obviously political or really clearly speak about like, Western philosophy or the education system and trying to dismantle some of that or decolonize it, like education, if you're speaking from a different context, but like then we think about that and then we start to work. How do we work with this? And like as we're working with it, it just automatically comes from a totally different place that is like much more emotional and like spiritual and deeper. And then like we try to like have those things like reflect back on each other or like reconnect in the middle. So like we're, we're kind of drawing in from like lots of different things and like so we just As said you. like <laughs> dance like became really a, an important one for us and um, one of the interesting links back to the education system that we found is um, Ken Richardson I think it is gave a talk he's a theater um, pedagogue and he's has done lots of research about the like kind of the the lacks and missing things in the Western education system and he just gives a really nice example of like how Western education like is situated in our bodies where he says like in kindergarten you're still allowed to use your whole body in a learning process and then you go to grade school and you just are allowed to use your top half of the body as you start to learn how to sit in a classroom and then you go to middle school and high school and learn just to use your head and then you go on to higher education and like university and you learn just to use one half of your brain basically that's how he summarizes the education system and i think yeah and just in terms of culture buds and um, cuts and like education cuts like dance is the least regarded field in our education system or at least in the like dominant western education system that like most of us have, or at least I have grown up in. Um, so that's kind of was like a really strong like metaphor of like how do we even start to like learn using our bodies again? We don't come from a background in dance and we come from a more academic and like conceptual art background. So this year for us has been a lot about just starting to learn about Maybe you can speak a bit about like, yeah. the aspects. I will start to speak about that. I think too, it's a, like you just mentioned that, you know, we started doing this work when we were in Berlin and we had just both finished doing this master's program. And I think it, the first project we did about unlearning was creating this like alternative free school that was across the street from the university where we had just graduated, which was the Bauhaus, which is sort of a fragment of its former radical uh, self. 
and so I think it like came really starkly against that when you finish and you realize like oh there is um, still something missing <laughs> from from that process so um, somebody who's been a big influence in our research is um, Anna Halperin she's a dancer um, I'm just gonna read something from this book of hers uh, five decades of transform transformational dance and then I'll, I'll move on with some more images um, one of th one of the things about working with real life issues is that they can be transformative you work with an issue because it is unresolved and through dance we hope to discover new possibilities it is not about dancers it is not about interpretation of a theme it is real and by doing it you get to a different place or issue in your life the dance changes the dancer the purpose is to create change that's when we start to that's when we start to use the word ritual to distinguish that from dance as entertainment or dance as spectacle not that it could not be a spectacle or that it cannot be entertaining but that was not the purpose so this became a very important shift for me and I think what she's speaking about here is what I have thought a lot about in working with publics and participatory community-based um, art. I think I would have used very similar language to her, so it was very exciting to find her speaking about this. Um, and let me, I'll just, I'll dive in here. Some of you may have heard of this um, movement collective in Vancouver called Dance Troupe Practice. Um, and I became a member of Dance Troupe Practice, I guess, a year and a half ago. I'd always liked to dance, don't have any formal dance training. Um, heard that there was like a group of people meeting in the city. You didn't, it was for non-dancers and it was just like people who were trying to like work things out creatively through movement who, who didn't come from that background. Um, and so I like, you know, after the first time I went, totally, I was completely addicted. And so then have been meeting with them weekly for the last year and a half. And they've been going for, I think, seven years now. It was started by um, two dancers as like a project. They wanted to work with bodies that weren't, um, uh, weren't hindered by a formal training. And then it's just been, so this is the, the website from Dance Troop. I just was kind of passing through some images um, of it. But it's pretty interesting because, I mean, okay, sure, there's people doing movement who ha haven't been trained as movement, um, but like that's interesting in, in and to itself. But um, the fact of how it's organized as well, um, I mean, they are totally run non-hierarchical, so you can arrive, it's like 20 bucks a month to join and that just uh, covers the fee of the studio you can come and go as you please and you so as you walk in you sort of realize pretty early on that like it's completely shaped by whoever happens to be in the room that day um, so that and you can't actually tell like oh has somebody had a lot of experience leading this before is somebody a professional dancer is somebody a teacher is somebody else working in a restaurant like none of this is sort of spoken about it's just that we move through exercises um, and each person keeps sharing this ball keeps rolling around of who actually is in charge and, but I think like Dance Troupe takes this really, really seriously and I think actually a lot of people speak about this in theory of how to be producing creative acts, but I think it's a very challenging thing to do and I, I think that it's really amazing that it's been running for seven years like this. Um, so they were a huge influence um, for both of us and um, yeah, became really like a deep part of this practice and some of them were really involved within the project that we the unlearning weekenders and others were not for the two dancers that you um Marie rosner and holly i never met the other one uh oh this is on tape now i can't credit them <laughs> no it's okay <laughs> um holly and Marie. <laughs> I can check it. If I had Wi-Fi, I could check on the website for you. Um, but I mean, actually, that's kind of an interesting sign that like I've joined seven years later and it's not even, we're not even sure how this even began, but yet it's still going. So maybe that can be a stronger sense of how dance trip works. So here's a few images of, um, to give an example of sort of some of the stuff we were helping lead in dance troupe practice. So we came and said we're interested in doing this research on unlearning. We started bringing some readings and some exercises to test out. Um, and so this was one that we did where 
when everybody arrived we said okay take all of your bags and everything that all the belongings you have with you today and I want you to lay them all out onto the floor and we started doing different dances and movement around these articles and trying to like detach any of our um, uh, yeah detach our kind of personal experiences or needs from these belongings and then kind of using them as objects and maybe as like a duet partner as well you could think about it as that so there's just a few images here Um, so I think through this work of unlearning, we're st really striving, like we, like from the story that Catherine just told about uh, the detachment of the body through education, I think we're, tr we're trying, we're striving for a deeper embodiment to kind of guide this, this process and research for us, but neither of us do come from this dance background. Um, and I guess we, once we started doing some exercises and taking some workshops and working with different people, we realized like a different kind of awareness and intuition that came from working from that place. Um, and it became quite a radical shift for us, but also was a really, really difficult and challenging place. And we realized like in the end, we just continually like fell back on sort of education and comfort levels that we had known before. And that it really, and well, you'll talk about this in the procession as well is that we had dreamed of doing um, work that was much more embodied through dance and movement but in the end like there was really it was so challenging to do that and it already was quite like a raw place to be creative with people in public but to do that then with with the body in a really deeply connected way like that's a really challenging thing and I know there's like a few dancers <laughs> and movers in the audience that would be also interesting to hear from about that um, but to help us kind of get through, um, yeah, to kind of gain some more experience with this, um, we did a workshop with Helen Walkley, um, who's a Levan movement analyst. Um, and I, I have something here that we had a conversation with you a few months ago when we were starting this project. It's not an eagle anymore. It's not an eagle. Yeah, the eagle quietly blesses us. Um, I have a note from our conversation that came up that speaking of dance is making energy pathways that guide our physical realities and I think that's a really interesting notion um, and maybe connects also to some of like the visualization work that we had done of like maybe even then one step further then the movement creates this pathway and then you are maybe more easily can kind of make a path within a new reality from that um, We also um, met with Jane Ellison. She does these boing boing classes and other dance classes out of um, Adam Dance next to Western Front. Um, and then also with Tennis Hugel, also a um, dancer and movement therapist in the city. So we've done these three workshops as we were trying to do like really, there's a huge depth to the kind of like local dance history within Vancouver. So we were trying to, um, maybe you were gonna speak about this later too. We were just kind of discussing yesterday that really one of the big aims of this project was was to be taking in maybe as much as we were giving out and other people who are doing public works maybe um, reflect on this also. You finish a work and you just feel like completely drained, like you've just been giving and giving and putting out towards the public, but when is the moment actually when you are able to take back in to like refresh yourself so you actually might have something to offer engage people with. And it's not that you can do that by just like going into the studio for six months by yourself. Like at least for us, like it just doesn't work that way. So within this whole project, we were trying to find ways of replenishing. And, and one of that was like doing these workshops with different, different movement um, professionals in the city. Um, so here's an example of some movement stuff we were doing in public space, just as small exercises on our own. I'm just gonna kind of fly through some of these. I'll do that later. Uh, yeah, please um, jump in. I don't know if I want to steal your words. I just wanted to kind of bring up like some of the notions that were coming up in those workshops um, were around authentic movement and this idea of also co-creating uh, 
kind of scores and performative or creative acts in the moment with other movers and other bodies. And I think this is something that for us, like, yeah, is just really rich in terms of like where that can take you individually in terms of like an inward reflection, but also in terms of a dialogue with other people around you. And also something that kind of relates back to how we like to work in the, and with a public, which is around like a co-creation and a not rehearsed, but just like a sincerely and genuinely felt action of the way you're moving or doing something is because that is how your body needs to move right now and not because that's a movement that you've rehearsed uh, or studied or because somebody told you this is the right way to move. So it, like movement, the workshops we did around movement really helped to kind of bring that thought process into a, a, a body kind of movement process. So that, that was really, I don't know, exciting to have those things resonate like through the different workshops and also through like some of our other projects as well. Mm -hmm. One of, we were lucky enough to make a pilgrimage down the west coast and Anna Halperin is 96 and she still teaches weekly drop-in classes um, on her um, uh, famous dance deck that she has built here like into the trees. So we were able, we went and did two classes with her, um, which was really lovely and also amazing. And um, you know, there's a lot of knowledge and experience there. And we did a few interviews with her as well of the project that we were working on, which in a way is kind of like a like a, a contemporary version of something that she did in the '70s called City Dance, which was this like movement um, of dancers across the city, also from dawn till dusk. from the, the workshop that she was doing. Sorry, I was speaking about city dance. Um, yeah, so city dance also migrated across San Francisco and it went on for several years around like different themes. And once we were already planning the final procession, we realized that, that sort of city dance and uh, the procession were kind of dovetailing together in some interesting ways. So we did a kind of funny interview with her as well, where she was like, why does this still need to happen? What's going on? <laughs> was, like, there's flash mobs now. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need city dance anymore. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> so this, um, all of this research, so the ones locally with Jane and Tannis and Helen, and then also on the trip on, with um, with Anna Halperin, we gave the first two weekenders in the city. One was based in dance and movement, and the other one was props and costumes. But these also started to kind of merge together. So you can see there's a couple images here where there was different costumes that we made that enabled dance and movement to happen. Um, and these were kind of drop-in workshops. People could show up, um, whoever happened to hear about it or was interested. And the first one was a few hours where we um, worked with Dance Troupe to develop it, and there was, um, different exercises that happened as we were moving through alleys in the neighborhood around Public Dreams, who, who was um, providing their studio for us. And then the second one was in the studio. Um, and again, it was kind of drop-in. And we had some framework of how things, people were invited into that, but it also was quite porous. So people could um, bring their own ideas and we would try and find a way to absorb, absorb those into the whole. Um, I may be just gonna say one thing. Um, maybe just before you, okay, I have one small quote and then something to say before I pass you on to speak about the procession. Um, this is kind of connecting to what you said a few minutes ago when you interjected. So, so again, Anna Halperin. Um, one of the things about working with real life issues, uh, Hold on a second, maybe I'm reading. Oops, okay. In dealing with real life issues, to be totally authentic, we had to find a way of moving, feeling, and thinking that would become new tools. Um, 
like when I got cancer, I wanted to deal with this issue on a level of healing. I had to have an open vocabulary. How did I know what I was going to do until I worked through it? If I had a stylization of movement, it would have been very predictable. I could not have gotten past that from what I already knew. So I think this also plays like a big role within our work is that we're continually trying to push ourselves simultaneously inviting the public into that process with us. So things get kind of wild and messy and then pulled back in again and you know we have sort of a certain aesthetic we want to push but then that kind of gets pulled and teared by somebody else bringing their own in so it is kind of this um it's this kind of shape i think it's quite often this kind of shape um and i think this was interesting when we started doing some of the authentic movement work because within that they speak a lot about there being a role of a mover and a witness and that there isn't it is never a spectacle there isn't an audience so as soon as you kind of get rid of that dichotomy of the spectacle in the audience, then everybody is inherently drawn into that relationship and you have a responsibility of being together. So if you're the witness, you're really like holding space for that person to be able to move and be. And I think for us, that's really important because it also gets away from like a, con a certain way of consuming art that's really we're very dissatisfied or disinterested in. Um, we really like if somebody wants to come and see what we're doing, we invite them to be part of that public for us. We're not trying to create a spectacle. So in that sense, it kind of refers back to some of Anna Halpern's words where it's like more important about like, what is the feeling of being within that? And it simultaneously can be a spectacle that somebody could observe from the public, but for us, it's far more secondary. So we often usually kind of work with them, um, participants join in and there's kind of this like tight circle of people who really like, get on board and then we really invest like most of our energy in trying to de develop that relationship so which is great but also has its challenges as an artist <laughs> take it away Catherine so we like to set the bar like really really high <laughs> and make things almost impossible hence deciding to end this project with a 12-hour migrating <laughs> performance uh, participatory procession roaming through Vancouver which we have some of the people who lasted the, actually the entire 14 hours that it were there's a few in the audience here actually quite a few <laughs> so, good job <laughs> yeah so that's in, in some of the workshops and in the kind of process we've been engaged in here together over the last few months like that kind of became like a point of focus of where we're channeling our energy in terms of yeah creating a, a certain amount of activities exercises participatory performative actions or like readings performances that kind of looked out for towards the public and tried to engage the public or ourselves as we move through the city in different modes of embodying other ways of knowing and being that's kind of the premise of the of the procession so we had looked at um, a lot over this year of research at rituals and kind of how they function in terms of measuring time but also like pushing yourself to a, a point or boundary that allows you to reflect back in um, so I think the reason we decided to do this 12 hour durational performance was yeah to kind of force ourselves and push ourselves and into that extreme and the reason why we were quite set on moving through public space is the kind of and and doing the procession in public space connects back to like a series of yeah thoughts around like how do we like merge this art practice with real life how do we bring it into real space and become this kind of critical roaming mass like literally and by performing something in public space or acting out a gesture in public space we just automatically come into a place of like legitimizing something that is either not legitimized or delegitimizing something that in space usually is the norm or the acceptable way of being 
and actually in public space there is a huge amount of censorship around how we and self-censorship around how we move how we act how we allow our emotions to show or not to show so i think that's like the very core of why we decided to take it into the streets and yeah it just happened last this this like procession just happened last saturday so everything is still pretty raw and it's 12 hours of different activities that included like over like 60 active participants and many different people like hosting activities throughout so we're not we can't like show everything of that right now and and walking from Hastings Sunrise to Stanley Park mm -hmm. crossing both of the bridges yeah. here, so. so the documentation <laughs> of that um, is on our blog and I'm just gonna talk through like a few examples that can give you an idea of what kind of stuff we were doing along the way. So one of the very first like early morning actions we did, which came out of Dance to Practice, is trying to produce a kind of body grounding ritual where we try as a group to produce an a, like, improvised ritual for each other. And it begins with one person laying down and the other three people, we were in groups of four, the other three people moving around that body without touching it and kind of sensing out that space as the other person on the ground is like already relating to gravity and like it just becomes about all these like in between spaces and how we move through those then going on to bringing touch into um, into the action and the other three movers are allowed to interact with that body in a common understanding of like we're giving something to this body, we're trying to uh, bring generosity to this action. And then, yeah, interacting physically with that body and then rolling the body over to smell the grass. And then it like funnels around and uh, the next person gets the ritual done to them. And so it was like grounding and movement and like discovering like a collective body, but also trust. Um, as well as like producing this on, it was on a meridian in the middle of East um, Pender Street in, in Hastings Sunrise. So kind of doing, having that kind of like intimate act like amongst people's houses and driveways. Yeah. And, and like even the very like intimacy as you're bringing up of like having physical contact with people that you might have just met or that you are meeting for the first time and just like it just really goes to the very core emotionally of like what some of our human needs are that are so yeah kind of yeah, disregarded in, in often in Western society. So yeah, we've been doing a lot of work around different modes of walking through the city. In the dance workshop, we did like a slow motion walk, and so in the in the procession, we did a backwards walk. But before doing it, did a kind of reading that is by Cindy Blackstone and it's called um, Indigenous Knowledge Systems versus Western Knowledge Systems and it kind of lays out some of the fundamental differences in our philosophies where Indigenous Knowledge Systems always look to the past for knowledge and see the past as the place where there is a majority of knowledge that gets handed down through the generations and in Western knowledge we really look to the future and just always think that there's something better that we can get to and there's a disregard for like the knowledge of the past and a discredit continual discrediting and um, also the reading talks about kind of um, what happened in the process of colonizing what's known as the Americas how the Western European knowledge systems even though seeing themselves as superior just there is no space for multiple knowledge systems to exist or coexist and the reading kind of speaks about like the loss in terms of the European knowledge paradigm that we've kind of closed ourselves off to other ways of knowing and being. So we just set this kind of framework and context and then did a backwards walk which happens to be also a Chinese like meditation that is quite common at 5am to see people walking backwards to the city in China but like here it's not 
So we're doing that and it's a meditative act, but at the same time it also becomes very provocative. We actually had like lots of reactions from the public as to like why are you doing so like there's something offensive almost about doing something irrational in public space that doesn't appear to have an immediate logic to it, at least not on Western terms. And especially if you don't say that it's art immediately too, because that also is easily dismissive. <laughs> so if you say that people also don't get so disrupted, but if it doesn't have any any reason behind it, it is yeah, angry. So that's kind of another example, and it's very easy to do this, and to also if you <laughs> to and walk backwards, <laughs> <laughs> and like also like these actions kind of always give a certain amount of space for anyone that wants to, to join in in that moment. Maybe just to say too, so this backwards walk, we left from Crab Park. And Catherine did this reading that she just mentioned, and then we walked. There's this long strip towards the conference center where all of the um, uh, cruise ships come in, and it goes into this tunnel that's sort of like the belly of the conference center and the downtown. And so we did this walk, backwards walk that walked along this totally straight strip into the the belly of this building. Um, so it took about 20 minutes, probably the the backwards walk. So. I wanted to mention another activity, a third activity. Do you want me to go? Yeah, yeah. like, um, and lots of stuff happened in between. This was one of the closing activities, and it's a stick listening activity. <laughs> and the way it works is that you find a stick and just lay it between the two ears of two people, and then either by touching that stick with a, a second stick or with your hand or any other, like, substance like it really resonates the sound quite loudly into your ears so you can see Marianne playing it here almost like mm -hmm. a bow like a violin <laughs> um, and <laughs> sideline viewing it, <laughs> the sticks carry the sound to an extent that when two people are playing and a third one lays a stick across it and then another one lays a stick across it like the sound really moves through it kind of becomes like a kind of rise away yeah. And it's just nice to think about this idea of the stick listening because we always know we know about the talking stick, um, and this is a bit of an inverse uh, to the talking stick. And that it's really about like learning to listen, which is not that easy. <laughs> and we just all could, like yeah need more of it all the time. But it's also like a really beautiful tool for like improvising together and just being connected with other people and in a type of exchange with people yeah in a very simple So this was at the gesture. at the closing ceremony mm -hmm. that was down at uh, at third beach after the 14 hour of processing yeah. were you gonna say also too because there's a few people in the audience who also like led things mm -hmm. within the procession and I wonder if people wanted to speak about what they did or remark on something then like you're totally welcome to add that rather than us kind of speaking for your voice did you want you're nodding did you want to um, well I have a few things to say really but, okay. um, <laughs> I had crab park just after a sort of a meet up and a potluck that we had together as a space to sort of uh, gather back and find members of the group who were part of the public who were coming in a bit later went to Crab Park as another meeting spot and uh, did a number of activities so we led an activity that was eating the sun um, so putting our faces and our bodies up to up to the sun and letting letting us absorb that metaphorical light um, and then I did a reading um, from George Orwell that was written in 1946 that's called Some Thoughts on the Common Toad that sort of outlines um, like the changing of a season and the appreciation for those smaller things. Um, as everybody tried to sort of get into the sand and bury themselves a little bit closer to the earth, uh, sort of coming back to the earth in a way. Oh, gotcha. Oh, literally. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my name is Ash Tanisechuk. I was invited by Zoe and Catherine to document the event. And I actually was dueling uh, an SLR for stills and borrowed 
Zoe's handy dandy little point and shoot for videos. And uh, in moments where uh, video was more appropriate, especially with something like backwards walking, I think that's what came up first. We're like, you could take stills of us backwards walking and people were gonna be like, oh great, they're walking. So actually showing that it's backwards walking was really quite important, I think. I think so much so I didn't even take any stills of the backwards walking, I realized. Um, but it was, it was an amazing experience for me. I had talked with Zoe and Catherine a few times before the actual procession. Um, we had a meeting in Strathcona Park one day to talk about this. And I went into it last Saturday having like, way more questions than any idea what was actually going to happen other than the general map. There was a, there was a route plan. Um, but obviously, in such a long period of time, there's all sorts of anomalies that can come along, and they did. Um, but surprisingly, it pulled off really, really well. Um, we were meant to be at Stanley Park at 7 p.m., so that we would have two hours until the 9 p.m. sort of ending to do closing ceremonies and whatnot. We actually ended up pulling up like exactly at 9 p.m., <laughs> which is why the whole procession ended up being like 14 hours. But accompanied by the canoe. Accompanied by the canoe, which I don't think has come up yet, but you should talk about. Um, but overall, it was just an incredible experience of really what it set out to be, which was unlearning, because as long as you live in a city and you think you know it, you don't really. And I, there was parts of the city I hadn't seen before, like where we did the backwards walk. And uh, also just seeing it through a different lens, like literally through camera lenses, but also doing things in places you wouldn't normally do. And I think it was a, a life-changing experience and a very positive one. And uh, I'm very happy to have been a part of it. Great. I know at the end, Ash was like, so are we can do that in a few weeks? Like, do it again. <laughs> Actually, I'm keep it. Oh. <laughs> So I just passed around, these are the programs, from just, I should have passed them bef before, but just because we can't speak about the whole event and there are images on the on the website. But this was a program that um, shows how, how the day was progressing. So when folks, when we had to um, uh, deal with this really tricky situation of like strangers sort of curious about what we were doing or people arriving into the middle after we had had this quite intense group already this was like one of the tools that we also had for like facilitating to be able to show people sort of what was happening because that was quite a hard um, moment actually to deal with was bringing people in and out um, so I wanted to read like one more quick quote from this text oh I have one too and then we can maybe <laughs> open up <laughs> I yes. said it first <laughs> oh. <laughs> No, and then we can open up to discussion because like, yeah, like we presented a lot of our intentions today and like a few things that happened, but yeah, obviously like lots of stuff happened that we didn't see coming or things like also like the reality of testing things out in public space like brings up so many things to discuss. So we can do that in a second. I just wanted to read one more thing that links back to India from the wonderful uncertainty reading. And it says, a 1936 report produced by a committee set up to examine the conditions of museums in India complained that the foremost museum, museumological problem in India was the fact that vast hordes of illiterate people flocked to museums not to know but to wonder. In fact, the colloquial Hindustani term for museum was Ajaibgar or House of Wonders. The report concludes that the only way to improve museums and museum going and the appreciation of art and culture in India was to discourage the illiterate itinerant and make museums places in which to create the appropriate aware of modern subjects, the projected future Konoshanti. Since that day, museums in India have become sepulchral. The living breath of disorderly, ill-informed, wandering and wandering visitors who walked in and out of galleries as freely as they walked in and out of competing knowledge systems and epistemic frames has given way to the hush of empty halls and display spaces. Okay, that was 
I have something in closing by Michael Tosic and uh, Barbara Ehrenweih, which is Dancing in the Streets. Michael Tosic. Um, History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. How will the body reconnect with the body of the world? Um, Frederick Jameson says it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And I want to ask why this might be. Is it because the end was always built into the subliminal mythologies by which we live and is in fact desired as an apocalyptic rush preceding global renewal? Might there not be, however, quite another mythic and poetic resources, resource that, will, that we can call upon involving new techniques of the body and reconstellations of the bodily unconscious that this crisis brings forth? So I also just want to read this last couple sentences because I think that also relating back to um, like an art world that we still are creating this work within. So there's kind of many constellations that I think we're creating this work in and for. Um, and I think within the art world there is a lot of discussion of this kind of work speaking about community. And something that came up in um, Barbara, uh, Barbara Enfeig's book, that, so it's a history of collective joy. Um, I think it speaks, kind of opens up this question of something beyond community. So everyone's vaguely aware of the decline of community human societies have endured in the last few centuries. A development many social scientists have analyzed in depth. Here we are looking at a much sharper, more intense form of pleasure than anything implied by the word community. With its uh, evocations of coziness and small town sociability, the loss of ecstatic pleasure the, of a kind once routinely generated by rituals involving dancing and music and so on deserves the same attention accorded to community and to be equally mourned. That's closing it. <laughs> closing quotes. So we're very much interested if people have some questions or have other things to raise or things to add to what we're already following um, within, yeah, like, I mean, that this was this really um, very intense year of research into unlearning and that both of us are, you know, will continue and we're not quite sure yet how and how, <laughs> how, how that will make. Um, so yeah, if people have questions or thoughts. Mm -hmm. super challenging and it worked on different levels so I think the the more successful method was that we offered these workshops in advance and so we kind of developed an inner core of people that connected to that research and connected to that mode of working and over the several weeks we kind of dove into this planning around the procession together and this became a kind of inner core of people that joined from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and really did the whole thing together with us and we supported each other in that walk. And I then, so I was just gonna say, I think within the planning of it, we had specifically like um, had like community partnerships. So we were working with the Windsor House School with dance troupe practice. Um, there's a senior, um, yeah, Public Dreams, there's a senior, um, 
South Asian women's tea group that we had connected with. So we kind of reached out specifically to people, but also anyone who's do sort of done community and participatory work. Like we our thought was like, oh, we'll, we'll work with these groups for months and they'll develop this bond. And then of course all those people will show up. But in the end it was, you know, like a few from each of those. And then there was like, beautiful random people who just like arrived into this little crew mm -hmm. so yeah there was the also a lot of logistic <laughs> issues around doing a 12-hour event is that uh, yeah there was a kind of core group that traveled throughout the day but then there was different times and places where certain partners hosted something or yeah led an activity and then the core group moved on kind of to the next thing so it became like this yeah like a procession that, that just kind of moves through all these different steps and stops along the way to act out certain things or narrate certain things and so we like in terms of PR we put that out through like flyers and through those networks and through dance networks and some community and art networks um, and then just maybe also like to lead into if there is another discussion, like one of the challenges the profession kind of faced throughout the day was, yeah, this kind of energy that builds between one point and the other where people come and go. So like energy kind of left as people left and then new people come in and aren't at the same place. back place in terms of what the the rest of the group has been going through so that became like a kind of a challenge throughout the day and yeah a format we hadn't used before so it's also new for us to do that and it comes like with certain things to gain but also comes at a certain cost so that was a struggle for us throughout the day yeah. and also exposing and opening ourselves up to any public to join that has been a big, big discussion for us in the last week like because the intention never was to be like I mean, we were open to the public, but it was never to be like walking down the street and like grabbing as many people as we could. Like our understanding always was like, if we have like four really engaged people, then like we have those four amazingly engaged people. Like it wasn't about trying to like convince others. And that's sort of why we also like targeted the community groups saying, we think that you might be interested in what we're interested in. And we sort of pitch it to them and if they were, then they would jump on board. So. having this ongoing <laughs> conversation about like the open kind of model of how um, just yeah, inviting totally. people to <laughs> participate and I'm just wondering what your reflections were on that after, yeah. after the fact. Our main reflection is that oh it became really hard to um, like a lot of the stuff we're doing is really vulnerable and uh, it takes like a lot of faith in yourself and trust in yourself and trust in the group to go to certain places especially publicly so yeah just um being open to any public to step in and bring kind of energies that are more aggressive or disruptive or um sucking energy from the group like became a struggle throughout the day for us and like one of the kind of reflections we have in terms of like continuing the project is we're really curious to try it again and just be a closed group. And just to like experience how that would go differently if not anybody can just join in. And it's like a preset interesting discussion um, with some friends who also are doing this kind of public participatory work and we were sort of like teasing ourselves a bit that there's always this assumption that like if you're totally open to the public it makes the project better you know it's more like unilateral and it's like more democratic but actually that that like so much is lost in that and it's kind of false anyways like it can't ever be open to everyone at all the times and so we were just reflecting that like even just simple things if we had at the beginning of the day been like okay the people who have committed to be there for 12 hours like this is us and like we're just going to commit to this and really like creating um a space of safety where we can really challenge ourselves on a deeper level and like that that sort of needs to be held together so i think that's like one of the reflections that we had it was like just changing that one thing actually would have made a big shift because 
it w which is different than how we moved and we would arrive at a group and they would be like we met this um this senior um chai group in the evening and we arrived there and we had like food and tea and dance with them for like an hour and then we left and there wasn't we didn't need to like bring them into like the zone with us because they weren't processing with us so it was a little bit different in that way but mm -hmm. yeah, these kind of assumptions that you you don't even realize you're making in your own practice like if somebody had asked me like oh well you know what do you think about you need to include every public I would have been like no of course not but not even realizing actually the small details you've included in your own project that is that <laughs> so yeah that's one thing Mm -hmm. in, in a way that seems a bit contrary to uh, some of your notions of, of what the project is. Yeah, it is. It you know, is because suddenly question. you're talking about exclusivity rather than inclusivity, and and what is the uh, what is the unlearning? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, on one hand, I can, I can understand because you want you you could create a container that. Uh, something very particular could transpire in, so I, I, I get that, yeah. but but also I, I do feel it's a bit contrary to to be exclusive. If you think of ritual, if you think of ceremony, um, who's there is who's there. I think it's good that you mention it, and I think like our reaction right now is like really fresh and raw, and it's like the, a few situations came up throughout the procession that. We're kind of bigger than what we could handle. And I think that's why like our reaction right now is like, oh, like we should have just not let those people in. But I think <laughs> but it's also the but learning. that's yeah. the learning <laughs> exactly. at the end. Learning. <laughs> and how are you gonna learn that if you don't get in that situation? Yeah. yeah totally. Know. Lupe, do you wanna say something? Yeah. Um, I was really late, sorry that I missed uh, a lot of it. But um, I think that in terms of unlearning, um, for me, like something really important is also uh, unlearning the meaning of, of certain words, you know, and questioning that a little bit in the sense like, what does it mean to exclude and what does it mean to include? Um, because I agree with, with I, I follow what the discussion, but I also think like, um, like in terms of ritual and ceremonies, there's also like a previous commitment to the, the space. And I can see how in order to, find, to to meet that that safe space that, that is needed for, for a ritual, um, that sense of com commitment is needed to, and someone that steps in to that space without really knowing or without choosing beforehand. Um, so I'm just really putting a question: what's it, what does it mean to include, exclude, exclude and include, and, and how? I think that sometimes with a lot of terms, that in a way. Um, involve politics um, you know we tend to just like go to the the, the most common or the, the closest definition of that word um, in order not to compromise a political position or da 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 but I think in certain situations um, those words need to recontextualized and, and readdressed and reassessed and really question you know what does it mean because I, th I don't know for me in, in a situation like that I would totally like um, privilege the, the commitment to the sacred space if you want over having an open I don't know I mean it's complicated but I think it's an interesting discussion. What comes up in what it reminds me of a lot is like when we went to India and we were witnessing all, a lot of public ritual and a lot of ceremony and religious ceremony in public space and both of us were really surprised that what from our cultural lens looked like not the proper respect or reverence like people were just like walking in and out of these rituals doing whatever like there was like super busy and bustling around them and and like it I think it took for us a moment to like understand that our like yeah uh, notion of reverence was really culturally focused around silence and or like just a, a different way of showing reverence than we have em, encountered there and I think it like goes back to this openness and like people are like free to 
interact with that ritual in a way that I hadn't been used to and it was just like a really interesting way of like re yeah assessing some of the terms that we but I think also so between what both of you are saying like I sort of see it on like different levels or like different layers that like and I think that we yeah just upon re on reflection I think that we within the procession were like placing many different layers together and that it would be we're interested in like okay how do we rework and continue this project like maybe it is interesting to kind of separate some of those layers and sort of work and practice within those before like remerging them again so yeah and like one of the like first words to like redefine would be public right like this like project operates like on like five or six different levels of public and publics and just like in terms of like inner circle and outer circle and then the public here and then those the public from previous and like it just really is and somebody we had like every, a like a trying to was sorry. trying to hit all those marks but is it still public if it's just focusing on two of those concentric circles right which w got brought up by some of the folks who were like long-term participants within this project we did this reflection ceremony on the day after the procession and uh, we were discussing of that, like, oh, we weren't really reaching out that much to the public. But then somebody said, oh, well, this is a public. Like, we were all strangers, like, three weeks ago. Like, it just really, like, none of us knew each other from other situations. And yet we came together and, like, really developed, like, a, a short-term collective to produce this work. And so that, yeah, I think is not to be underestimated. So. The idea of unlearning and uh, recasting of ritual is fundamentally fundamentally uh, ideological. And in India, you picked on um, the uh, colonial legacy which plagues the Indian psyche. Uh, here, you picked on a theme of um, uh, the challenges of neoliberalism. And these are pretty simple, I mean, ideologies for progressives to get behind. I mean, they're within progressive thought, these are, this is pretty low-hanging fruit and pretty non-controversial. Um, to what extent is it important for your exercise for your research um, what the ideological foundation is um, and which ideologies uh, are getting rejected and which are getting romanticized um, and to what extent have you I mean does it matter can you can you pick anything um, and to what extent does the um, the function of ritual itself as a propagator of ideology um, make it a very problematic tool to use uh, in the process of unlearning. All right, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> I think it's a great question. Yeah. I think obviously like we only like first and foremost are speaking from like the perspective of the education system and culture we come from, right? Obviously, we're not unlearning like an Aboriginal philosophy because we don't even have one. <laughs> like, it's not in us. So, like, I don't know. At least for me, like the example of like the school and the education in terms of where it's located in the body, like, totally resonates for me. And that's something I want to unlearn. And I can connect to a lot of other people who kind of come from a Western mainstream like education system in that term. And like, we do live in a at least for the most part of the world where the Western philosophy is a dominant paradigm. And that's the one I chose to pick on. Like, also because I feel like it's failing us on so many levels, like spiritually, but also ecologically and health-wise and just like all those issues that are coming up in our society, like I think link back to this, like a, yeah, failures in this philosophy. And for me, that's something I feel like personally invested in. So that's the perspective I'm speaking from. 
And I think like there is definitely a romanticization of ritual, but I think it links back to just a lack in Western education of song, of movement, <laughs> of like those types of ways of like embodying I ideology. And actually Western philosophy, like in Western education, like or capitalism or neoliberalism, we don't speak about that I on an ideological level. Like in East Germany, when there still was East Germany, like you have to take a, like ideology of communism as one of the main classes in school. They like self-analyze their ideology. I never had like a one-on-one on the ideology of capitalism in my classes in school. Like we don't analyze our own ideology in that way, but maybe there should be more of it, you know? So I think that kind of... So, so let, me, let me give you a good... Uh, <laughs> Hang on, let me let, let me let me push back on that a, a little bit. Um, okay, in India, I'm a, I mean I'm all about shedding uh, uh, the uh, burden, the colonial burden on the modern Indian psyche. I mean it's just it's it's decades and generations of a legacy that should not be there. We agree on that. But how interesting would it be to unlearn? the Vedic structures, the spiritually seeking structures of India, which are also deeply entrenched and um, deeply uh, mm -hmm. formative uh, or ideologies. Or the caste system, right? Uh, Easier heck, one to pick on, I guess. <laughs> God. Um, I mean, why, why not strip away all the beautiful religious rituals, all mm -hmm. the spiritual seeking? Why not unlearn learn all that? Um, well, maybe it's, that's their unlearning path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can. Right. I mean, but uh, but how do you begin? How do you prioritize? Or does it matter? Is it important? Mm -hmm. Is it is it, at, at some level is it important to the exercise, or is it simply important to pick, have a target and work around that as as a functional? Mm -hmm. I, I think you. I think maybe you're assuming it was like a far more like rational decision. Like, okay, these are the things we have to pick from. Like, we're going to pick A and C and we'll deal with the rest later. It. it wasn't at all. And I think what's actually really important about this project, and maybe was illustrated a bit by like the rituals that we were doing, trying to produce ourselves, was like, we're trying to like find a way through our like daily routines. And there's like things that are missing and things that are challenging and things that are beautiful and amazing. And like, how do we kind of pull those in to like fill some kind of void that we are feeling from the society that we're living in? And I think that came on like a really, really personal, like fundamental basis. And that this was that we actually had to locate in that place. And then, and then like what better way to do that, like actually locate in my body and in my experience and like name and know that and then move forward from that. And I think that's also why we're more interested in like inviting like smaller publics in into something that is more intimate rather because then there is space for others to reflect and find their place within that rather than making some broad sweeping assumptions of like okay this is what everybody must be feeling and I think this quote that I read at the end too also speaks to this in terms of like okay we're all talking about oh we've lost a sense of community but it's like okay that is a very vague thing and where she's speaking where she's like no it's something much sharper like far more fundamental that we are missing and also needs some space and and I think actually this is in something that we are still like searching to define like mm -hmm. what what are we needing to unlearn and learn <laughs> yeah like it's I mean we're comfortable with this place of, of ambiguity even though it's fairly uncomfortable yeah and Helen <laughs> wanted to speak yeah? in but, but I feel that the way that you just described what you're doing is very very different than the, the two sentences that, I'm sorry, Ash, Ash. Ash read at the beginning, which I've also read on your site about new forms, of, new forms of criticality and social hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, like those two sentences are so, the languaging of those two sentences are so different than what you just talked about. Yeah. You talked about everyday life and embodiment. I think this came, this came up as well, actually, last week when we had the reflection ceremony. And I, I mean, I think part of this is like language that's happening before some, before an event and language that's happening in the reflection after the event. So part of this is yeah, like ambition and intention. That language. Ah, okay. Well, that's a good... <laughs> and, and because then you might find the language that really describes what it is that you're doing. But maybe because I just I did. like that language is very learned. Mm -hmm. the, the one in the text yes. before. Yes. Okay, but maybe I just did in the three weeks from when I wrote that text before and did all the weekenders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
maybe you're from maybe I can yeah well we were speaking about this yesterday actually like we also looked back in the text and thought huh this is funny this is how we were speaking of this a few weeks ago and how we're speaking of it now is really different yeah. so there will there will be some shift within that so <laughs> yeah um really well me it, it was before um, <laughs> she, she spoke so um, I think that, that first what I, what I wanted to say to, to Mark's comment is that um, the way I'm understanding the research on the project is uh, not so much about the subject matter that is being criticized or put a question, but rather the processes and moda modalities that we use in order to know. So in a sense, I, I think that what I appreciate is that regardless of what we are addressing, what we're changing is the way in which we are approaching it. So the ritual or, or um, the method, modality, whatever, is in a way, the, through embodiment, the way in which we're going to change how we know, how we, how we define, how we relate to everything, the world or the other or whatever. And I think maybe that is where that. And then the other thing, um, I also really like what you just said about the, the unlearning that kind of language. Um, I hadn't thought about it. It's, it it's kind of like I'm taking that with me to think about. Um, but then also I think there's two things to that. One is that um, there's always like the complication of sort of like, you know, this Sufi saying like being in the world but not of the world. And in a way it's like you're operating within the art world and there's like a language that belongs to that as much as when you're a biologist, you speak in whatever terms that I don't know. And it's always like a challenge, I think, to navigate those because there's obviously like politics embedded in that, you know, like academia. I mean, we all, everyone, I mean, we, we, we know that. <laughs> um, but then also I think that, that they are, to, they go together. Like, like this unlearning of, of modalities is definitely res like a political resistance as well, you know, in that it's like a resistance and a criticism and, and almost, if you want, you can frame it within the political in the sense of like, um, Yeah, like challenging what we are being imposed, and what, you know, like by culture or by the system or, or, or whatever it is. So I think it really plays in different realms, you know, like, um, anyways, yeah. that's all. Yeah. I, I, yeah. This is like, sometimes I am frankly so stunned by how artists describe their work. Like, I read something, mm -hmm. I, it can even just be like a little. Well, I'm, I'm a dancer by yeah. profession, okay? So, you know, like I read people, what people say about a, a, a performance I'm gonna see. Yeah. Like, I'm like, my God, like how did they get there? I mean, I feel, feel like the language is so... Convoluted. What? Convoluted? Like, you know, it's just, like dry it just seems or? like way too much to me, mm -hmm. you know? Like, and I, and I really feel questioned about that, like yeah. how artists speak about what, what they're doing and how it really relates to, to life and to expression. And how it connects, how it connects and communicates. To, to be honest, for me, it has to do with with um, the art world and the art system, and the fact that, uh, in a way, it, the profit professionalization of the art responds to certain requirements, if you want. And obviously, it's a choice whether to be there or not. But sometimes I think, I don't know. I think I'm I'm kind of leaning to that, but. I agree with you, and yeah, that's very. I, okay. That's very. That's very. Yeah. I've been an artist for 33 years. Yeah. So that's a long time. <laughs> and um, you, you know, how, how do you play into the system or work work with the system when you're wanting their support? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very. That's a very delicate line. Yeah. But I think you have to be true because that's that. You know, that, then that's what group is supported because it's recognized as being authentic. Yeah. I, I have to say, as, as somebody who participated in this thing um, uh, throughout the week, the various weekends and the, 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 the procession, um, I was, I've been wrestling with this question of the relationship between ideology and the, the initially stated manifestos and the execution throughout the whole process and that's was, was a, it's a question that's really been plaguing me throughout but the way Zoe just described the process as um, um, 
the reworking of the rituals and the decisions about um, what processes to try and um, uh, tackle in terms of unlearning uh, strikes me as a really candid, very honest, incredibly accurate description of the dynamic. And when you look at that within the collaborative process that these weekenders were, you know, a bunch of, of essentially strangers uh, coming together to um, make these decisions in a, in a, in a really collective, democratic, um, uh, kind of vectored but largely unstructured way. Um, it's interesting that what manifested out of that was a um, something very interesting reflecting on, on the way Zoe just described this. Maybe it didn't so much um, develop um, an ideology, but a new sense of community, a sense of community that was based on those individual decisions by the collective group about uh, what, to, what to try and unlearn, what to try and recast in terms of ritual, and the way those individual decisions came together in this collective process um, may actually have uh, manifested in something that is a palpably and describably different sense of community, if only for the duration of the performance. Um, and that is really interesting and really powerful and may just be, at least from my perspective, the most interesting aspect of the whole process. Is the sense of community? Well, is the sense that when you take individuals who have different personal feelings about their own desires, about what's working for them and not working for them within the existing um, social structure um, and interpersonal dynamics, that so they're making individual decisions about this is what I want to unlearn and this is how I want to try and recast this in a new ritual. When when, every, when, when you have these different perspectives coming together to do that collectively, it basically shape, it basically redefines the um, communal interaction among them. Instead of working from the standard social paradigm where we walk up and we shake hands because this is, this is the ritual that, the ritual structure that we work in, this is how we greet, um, you may have a, an idea of for a new ritual of greeting that's based on um, your own priorities for unlearning. I may have a, a ritual of greeting based on things that I want to unlearn, but when we both involve ourselves in this process, now we have to, now our, our greeting rituals have to mediate between them. And when this happens in a broader group, a group of a dozen or so people who are committed to participating in this process, all of a sudden, um, new rituals within the group develop for the duration of the performance and necessarily transform the relationship of the group and create, in a very real sense, a new community. So it's a real, it's like an experimental microcosm of, of that probably points to greater social possibilities. Yeah, I just want to say, from my experience, or from my experience in the group, I think one of the things that came up doing the whole thing was expectation, and it's kind of what I'm hearing a bit here today, like everybody here has a different expectation of what they want art to do for them, what they expect any type of experience to do for them. And I just speak for myself, when I came to that, I didn't expect to change the world on Saturday, I didn't think it was going to change all the society's rules, I didn't think it was going to change me dramatically, what I really wanted was just an experience, something that might alter my state a little tiny bit, just give me a little different perspective, and that's what I feel I achieved, I really do. And I thank uh, Zoe and Catherine for that experience, but that's basically what I went for, and, and uh, that was achieved for me. Yeah, it, for me it brings up a lot of um, questions around evolution and what is cultural evolution, and you know, 
are we evolving towards something different or is it just a big experiment and um, I, I remember having a conversation with a friend who was laughing about this idea that what if we could just um, what if we could just unlearn patriarchy just all of a sudden and just imagine you just unlearned it like how would you be different in the world and what would that look like and um, and I think in a way you know there's a sense in that that we've gone wrong somewhere along the line and you know I'm sure this is something that you've talked about that um, even though the ways that that things have happened have resulted in in a lot of um, a lot of uh, difficulty and you know social structures that we um, we see that they've failed and at the same time um, things have come to us through um, through the path that we've taken that are really important like the the possibility of having in you know universal human rights which wouldn't have been possible in um, you know in, in certain mental and social structures that is not recognized as being uh, you know as being legitimate um, in a more sort of collectivist culture so you know in a way we're still navigating that there's no we haven't yet found that perfect way of being together and no culture or society ever has or ha or does now so or will perhaps exactly so um, you know what's what's evolved out of this you know what does it you know, I'm, yeah I mean I'm, I'm sure that's still crystallizing for you like what's actually evolved out of this and where is it taking you in terms of how how we're going to be together but still I think that to some extent like like I agree that it's like there is a disconnect in terms of what happened and what was written but I think it's also a kind of approach or, or way of pushing a certain amount of content that if we would have just said our intention is to create community and a special experience like, you know, <laughs> that would have been interesting. I want to hear you agree with that. Uh, no, I mean, I, I yeah. like, I think, like we said, like a, an impossible endeavor, mm -hmm. but that shapes and directs a certain thought processes in in the activities, even if they seem completely like, yeah, absurd or foolish or whatever. Like, I think yeah. that there is like a purpose that is on one hand like deeply personal but also on the other hand like let's collectively like just put those like questions out there that are impossible to answer but still like try to move in the direction of even considering them that I think it does bring something also to the project even if it is a an inherent setup for, for not achieving that. Well, I think we like can't even help it that we have really like lofty ambitions, and luckily there's beautiful people like Ron who join in our projects who have uh, less high expectations, and we can kind of meet somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just I think the disconnect that you're talking about between the initial planning out of what you think the project or what you want the project to achieve, and then the actual afterwards, which is a, a language that is, you know, said very much uh, less professionalized. Or, or, um, I, I think that speaks to the um, success in a way of that project. Um, and, and that's just from my own experience, having taken part in the 12, 12 hours is of my personal work as an artist is, is also very much in terms of kind of um, not necessarily unlearning, but uh, producing different behaviors or behaviors that are not um, normative in the public sphere and, and trying to see what, what happens from that. But I always do that from a very critical standpoint and like having already, you know, thought out what, what I'm thinking about and theorized it and then I arrived in this project initially still in that framework and then kind of gradually throughout the all of these different workshops that we were doing, kind of trying to let go of this and actually saying, okay, I'm I'm not the artist here, I'm going to be part of some, and they're going to take me in and lead me into this experience. And throughout that whole 12-hour um, day, just totally being in the moment and in the present and 
not thinking about about it, not critically reflecting on it, not. And that was such a relief, not a relief, make them. Speaking, but so, yeah, just it's so great to just be, just actually be in the experience and not really think. I don't know, really, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't, I didn't want to have expectations at that point when I started. It's going to happen, and I'll, it'll be, and I'll see what happens from it. And, um, and I, hopefully that's part of that process of our learning to have these expectations or for me. Anyway, so, and that's really great. Well, I, I just to, by, uh, by the way, I, I didn't offer that as criticism. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't, I, it, it, I didn't offer it as criticism. I, I, I just found it interesting. I think it's very normal mm -hmm. that as an artist, you know, how you write about what you do, and then what becomes is, is like there's a whole distance in between. But Absolutely. to bring it forward as, as conversation and reflection oh, on, on what you've done. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it totally goes back to like a thing that came up for us in dance group all the time, where it's like, do we start an exercise like from the brain of like conceiving something and then testing it out, or do we start moving and then reflect upon the movement that happened? Like we got caught between those things like a lot and we're trying to like see mm -hmm. the differences in those approaches and I don't know I think it, yeah just speaking for myself I totally like have been trained to like conceptualize something before I do it mm -hmm. and that brings up the yeah I think that you were talking about kind of pull, uh, in, in next time a bit more picking a smaller group and more exclusive and I think something is lost and I think the project overall was this big mess and a bit of a failure in a lot of ways and I think that's why it's successful <laughs> trying to like <laughs> bring the, I think trying to bring the you know this idea of unlearning and do this like art project that gets that's funded and then is tied in the art world and then trying to make it public and having this small group of people and people come, coming in and out. And, I mean, I my experience is of an outsider and my friends kind of being around and being like, what is this kooky shit that's going on? Uh, what's going on? <laughs> Seeing some squabbling, some arguments in this moment. And uh, I think all those layers of awkwardness really, really creates this, this whole conversation that has happened is kind of sums up what the whole experience was. And, and I think Butting up this idea of unlearning, which is something learned, and it, there is like through this talk, you read all these quotes that come from people, and there's a lineage and, and a history there, and something you're learning about, and trying to butt that up again, and do an art project about it, and the whole art world stuff, and the whole conversation about these professionalizing devices. I think this shows the these kind of failures around ideas, this idea of unlearning in certain ways, and that this was such an ephemeral and momentary thing and for that moment you were unlearning but or maybe you weren't maybe you were learning something different but that ultimately it's only momentary and you were only in this bubble you were like 10 people in this bubble for a few hours and then you go back to being yeah <laughs> So this is just a very. This has been like running through my mind, and, and uh, I don't know how to fit it in. But for me, it's a part, and um, I feel that ritual and ceremony has real protocol that is in fact learned. And when you when you enter into a ceremony, you prescribe to the protocol, and it, and well, dependent upon what the ceremony is. If you're not prescribing to it, someone's going to come and tell you, <laughs> and they're going to say this is the way it goes yeah. now. You know. Yeah. So I, I, I'm curious about that okay. notion of ritual and ceremony in relation to what you people have done. It's, I think it's something we've been fighting all the way along. Like the most heated discussions we've had with people are like the use of this term ritual and thinking mm -hmm. of ceremony. But really like feeling a really deep personal connection to like wanting to work with ritual and ceremony and not having it exist in my own life. And then, and like, can I actually produce these things on my own? Like at some point, somebody produced them on their own. And like through millennia, it like developed to what it is today. But, and through this, 
like I don't know if it's actually possible. Like I don't know if they just became like performative acts. Like do you need to do it a thousand times with somebody else before then it is a ceremony or a ritual? And I mean it was more this like open question of if that's possible and I don't know that through this we were able to like one of our ambitions from the beginning was creating public ritual for Hamani. And I don't know I, I don't think that we did that. And I don't know if that it is possible in a few months, in a few weeks, in a few hours. Like, I don't know that that's possible. But I think that that brought, like, a, a richness of um, other people's traditions and other ways of knowing that, we're able to, that we were able to, like, learn and be influenced by. So I think, it was, again, it was sort of this, like, ambition to, like, look towards that. And, yeah, I, that is, is a tall order. <laughs> Because you're absolutely right. Like the ritual has its own forms and very specific steps to follow. Otherwise, it's not a ritual. So, in a sense, um, I don't. I'm, I'm. I don't know. There's really great questions that, that the conversation is bringing up for me. But something that I've been thinking about has to do with uh, more the relationship between ritual and dogma. And so, and dogma. So. Um, for me, I, I feel more resistant to when something becomes dogma, and, and I'm, you know, just starting to think about it more recently. But um, I just wonder where, what are the, the difference between those two, and how, um, you know, where the the notion of imposition comes in, and and. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, I don't have these only like rituals and um, ceremonies in my own life. I resist the ones that are presented to me. But there still is like this this deep need for like sh like, and I was saying like this like sharper meaning than the word yeah. community. There still is like a longing for that, and it's like, I mean, what it, like what are the tools that I'm left with? And like there is like, okay, this is what I have. These are the people who are here. Like, let's try and move forward. And I don't actually, in some way, like know what else you can possibly do. Like, I think that that's sort of like the most honest way of kind of moving forward. And it's not tight at all. And I, like, I really appreciate what you're saying as well, Sean. And also, like, from being of the host, like with the Contemporary Art Gallery, like I think that it is like there's like a longing for something that's tight and packageable in the art world. Like, this is very in, in a way that it's like, oh, really huge ideas, but it's still tight and packaged so that you're, <laughs> so it's easily absorbed um, and understood. And I think it's like, the, like, I think we have a really strong discomfort with that, but at the same time, then you're not, you don't easily fit in because it can't be, it doesn't, like, it doesn't slot into that. So yeah, if you pitch something like this, we're gonna have this thing and it's like up and down and like success and failure and messy and chaotic and like people are, <laughs> like, they're, they're, as immediately. So I have a few brave souls <laughs> who are still left here. Well, I do respect that in your collaborative practice that this idea of, of authorship, of, of kind of letting go of those stuff in certain ways, but being a facilitator and allowing things to grow and, and having other collaborators, collaborators come into your practice, I think, I think is interesting. Yeah. Um, sadly, I think we need to and this public discussion, and of course it can continue, you can hang around, I just need to, my van with all the stuff needs to leave before seven o'clock, so. But feel free to hang out and talk longer, but I wanted to say thank you to uh, Catherine and, and Zoe, um, and everyone for sharing, it was a great conversation yeah. today. Yeah, yeah thanks, John.